All right, guys, we're going to get started. Um, I, the, the, this next hour is all about marketing. And we <laughs> have two uh, pretty incredible CMOs uh, and VP of marketing from companies that you've heard of coming on stage. So first, I'd like to introduce uh, Jeff Yoshimura. Uh, Jeff was one of the very first folks at Salesforce.com and the marketing team. He was there when they were just a small little startup, under 300 employees, um, and he helped grow Salesforce to, you know, to IPO. Um, he was one of the founding team members on the App Exchange team, and he helped launch that Epic brand, and he's going to talk about Epic brands today. Um, and then he was one of the founding members of the team at Zora, uh, and he helped drive that brand around the subscription economy. And now he's at Elastic who powers the developer platform called Elasticsearch, and he is running marketing there. He is here today to talk to us about building an epic brand. And by the way, I forgot to introduce myself. Um, Emmanuel Scala, VP of Sales from Influitive. Um, I all day talk to marketers, so it's a pleasure to be uh, here with Jeff today. I'm going to hand it over to Jeff, and we're going to take some questions at the end. Hello, everybody. Welcome to, uh, I guess, Thursday. Today's the last day of the event. Uh, super excited to be here today. Thank you for the introduction. I've known uh, Manuela and the, the folks over at Influida for a long time, so congratulations on all of the great work that you guys are doing on the ecosystem. You know, there's a, there's a lot of things that I could talk about when it comes to, to building a, a brand and clicker. So I'll go without the clicker. So there's a lot of things I can talk about about building a great brand. And the things that I won't talk about are, I'm not going to talk about marketing pyramids or brand pyramids, uh, messaging platforms, things that you guys can read about in blogs. You guys can read about these things on HBS. Uh, Saster does a great job with their blog. First Round Capital does a great job with their blog. Uh, but what I am going to talk about um, are some real life experiences that I've had over the past 15 years or so, uh, really helping kind of build four different brands. And uh, what's been, been really interesting as we reflect on today is every experience has been a little bit different. Um, there's really kind of no one size fits all formula. There's a lot of uh, iteration and, and, and adaptiveness that, that you need to take in, in building your company. So if you're just starting out your company or if you're at uh, that phase where you're, you're growing your business from that first five mil to 10 mil in revenue, or if you're accelerating, uh, hopefully there's something that, that each of you can take away from today. Uh, I'm going to start with, with the App Exchange. Uh, the App Exchange uh, was a, a project that got kicked off in, in 2005, and it was kind of a skunk works project. And uh, Mark Benioff wrote on a piece of paper, I want to build the eBay of business applications. And he handed that paper to Teen Zhou, who was chief strategy officer, employee number 11, and the first CMO of Salesforce, and said, go figure this out. Go figure out how to you know, create this marketplace. This was pre-App Store. This was pre uh, any type of, of real kind of marketplace that exists today. Uh, and Salesforce was still pretty new. 2005 was a year after the IPO. Uh, 2005 was, was really when the, the company started to unleash some of the new tools around S-Force and building custom scripts and the ability to do kind of integration uh, within the platform. Uh, so it was really uh, something that was kind of this high in the sky idea, can you, can you pull this off? Well, fast forward to today, the App Exchange has grown to, to a million plus installs. They just had a 10 year anniversary party uh, about a month ago uh, in San Francisco and a lot of the old members of the team were there. Uh, and some of the things that, that we learned from, from that early, early experience was uh, the first 100 apps that we built weren't really apps. Uh, these were apps that uh, we took from, from the field. These were apps that, that sales engineers were building. These were apps that professional services people were building, or these were apps that some of the early, early partners were building. And these were, were simply just ways to get around a lot of the, at the time, a lot of the kind of deficiencies of Salesforce, meaning that you couldn't really customize the application to work for financial services. You couldn't customize the application to work for media. Uh, for, for high-tech manufacturing, Salesforce really didn't work. So the, this concept around these packaged applications really became the workaround for an S sales engineer and a sales rep and a customer success team to go and showcase how Salesforce can be extended. 
So the way that we got our first 100 apps was we went internally and we said, uh, we need to get 100 apps within 60 days. And uh, we, we had uh, you know, this massive influx of, of internal requests from folks that I'm building this app for, for this use case and that use case. And uh, we really curated the, the concept around the app exchange internally. Uh, we also did a lot of experimentation. So uh, for those of you who recall, there was a building on 101 at 92 and 101. That used to be the old Siebel building. Well, Salesforce acquired that building. We branded the app exchange. Uh, there was a, a little bit of media buzz around, you know, Siebel is dead. It's just now Salesforce's building because that used to be the old Siebel building. Uh, but we did, a lot of, uh, we did a lot of experimentation. We had an incubator uh, there in that building. Uh, we had... Um, this concept of category experts. So we took people from internally within Salesforce to look at the different, really, categories of applications that um, are going to help drive user adoption of Salesforce. Uh, we did things around certification. We did things around online advertising. When we first launched that marketplace, some of the things that, that really were special things that we focused on were, were things around, you know, let's think of the app exchange as something that is going to help our customers be successful with the deployments of Salesforce. And some of the key takeaways that we really got from, from that experience that might be applicable for folks here in this, this audience is back in 2005, 2006, uh, this was not a brand. Uh, the app exchange was just a concept and uh, it was a secondary, maybe even a tertiary brand within Salesforce. But the team that was working on the app exchange, we all believed in Mark's vision that this was going to be something that would be really, really special. So we treated it like a brand, and we invested in, in ways to, to make sure that we got the word out. So we did a series of launches. So when we got the first 100 apps, we did a launch. When we got the, the next you know, 1,000 apps, we did a launch. Uh, we did vertical launches around financial services and media. We went to large ISVs and, and recruited you know, big ISVs to go build applications because we knew that if we attracted the big ISVs, uh, it would also attract the, the smaller developers. So we really treated it like a brand. And as you've seen kind of Dreamforce, if you've been to Dreamforce grow over time, uh, that brand has also matured in terms of the early days uh, at Dreamforce. Uh, when the App Exchange launched, we had this, pro this, this program called Certification where uh, all the partners would get certified. And then we'd say, partners, we want you to unleash your press releases on day two of Dreamforce. And there would just be a flood of press releases. It would be, you know, Big Machines launches on the App Exchange, Eloqua launches on the App Exchange, Marketo launches on the App Exchange. So it just created this really, this really spread of, of, of really kind of buzz around this, this new ecosystem. Um, so, you know, letting partners, you know, participate and developers participate in the building process to help build your brand and extend the brand was something that uh, was, was something that we really learned as, as a, a critical success factor. Um, you know, thinking very big. Uh, if you look at a lot of the early articles back to 2005 and 2006, there were a lot of people that said, this is a, a crazy idea. It's not going to work. And uh, uh, there were a lot of skeptics. And, and that said, what we did with all this feedback was we channeled this feedback internally to make that product better, uh, to, to improve the packaging, to improve the user experience, to improve the customer experience. So channel all that feedback in, back into product development. And, uh, and, and make sure that that gets in so that that product becomes uh, better and better and, and more impactful uh, to, to, to end users. Uh, I'm going to talk about Zora. Uh, I left Salesforce.com to become one of the first employees at Zora. Ironically, we incubated Zora inside of the App Exchange building. So Teen Zo was employee number 11. He's CEO and co-founder of Zora. He was my boss uh, and my boss of many, many years. And uh, he came to me and said, I have this, this this crazy idea, I'm going to leave Salesforce after nine years and start this company, Zora. Mark's going to invest in the company, and uh, I want you to be one of my first employees. We were out on a business trip out of New York. So uh, I said, sure, why not? What else am I going to do? So uh, I went off, and uh, we started Zora inside of the App Exchange uh, building in San Mateo. We'd work evenings on, on a lot of the early concepts. And uh, you know, at Zora, what we really played around with a lot was, was messaging. Uh, and how do we elevate our brand? How do we elevate our messaging? Uh, no one really knew of this subscription billing model or subscription business model back in, in 2007, 2008. Uh, a lot of the great SaaS companies that today are, are very successful, multi-billion dollar companies didn't even exist. Um, so, 
you know, how do you get the word out that um, the world is different when you run a subscription business? So we just really kind of had this concept where the old world is all about kind of you buy now, single track commerce, uh, and the new world is about relationships. It's about this recurring uh, revenue stream. And we, we really drew the line in the sand around this concept called the sub subscription economy. And this wasn't the first thing we came out with. Uh, we we uh, had to come out with, uh, we started with on-demand billing. We started with uh, something called uh, subscription billing. We must have played around with so many different variations before we came up with subscription economy. And it wasn't until a reporter named Tom Tolley, he writes for Forbes today, great guy. Uh, he wrote an article called The Netflix Economy. And the Netflix economy within that article talked about the shift of business models. He referenced Zora in that article. And that's where we came up with the idea of subscription economy. And eight years later, this is something that is still being used at Zora. One of the other things that we decided that we really needed to do is if you've ever worked for Teen or if you know Teen, uh, he's a bit crazy. He's, he's, he's always online and he's pinging you with crazy ideas. So one night at midnight, he pinged me and said, in 48 hours, Apple is going to launch something at Moscone. So I want you guys to go out there and, and campaign in front of them. And I was like, this whole campaign thing is not going to work. We're not going to protest, put signs up. We're going to get kicked out, get thrown on the street. So uh, this was also a time when social media was just starting out. So what we decided to do was launch a social media campaign around Twitter. Uh, and we set up a site called Save Your Press. And this was also the time when Apple was really um, not being too friendly to media companies and publishers. And we were also selling to a lot of media companies. And they're saying, we want to use Zora. We don't want to use this Apple thing. This 30% cut isn't going to work for our business model. So uh, we uh, dressed up as, as newsbees, and uh, we, we created this, this flyer that was like an onion-like piece. And uh, we, uh, we went out there before the, the Apple launch, and we, we picked it around, and we gave it to all the reporters. This was the, a press launch, by the way. So we handed these things out to reporters, and uh, they were like, oh, who are you guys? Oh, we're from Save Our Press, and uh, we're, we're here to save the media industry. Uh, you sure not from a, from a company? No, 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 we're from Save Our Press. Some of the folks that were here, uh, that, there that day, Shannon Murray's right there, Katrina Wong, they were on, on my team, and uh, we, we, we pulled this, uh, this kind of stunt off. And uh, we ended up getting a lot of press, and uh, we ended up getting a lot of really good press around kind of what we're doing and a point of view. But it all pointed back to the subscription economy. It was all about this movement and shift of goods and services to the subscription business model. So have a lot of fun and uh, kind of think out of the box. And uh, I, I really have to, to thank Teen for, uh, for pushing us to, to do things like that. So a couple of things in terms of lessons learned at Zora. Company name does matter. Um, you know, it was not easy creating the brand for Zora. This whole thing of Z, Zora, is it Zora, is it Zora? Uh, it was especially hard for salespeople out there making calls. People couldn't spell it. So these were, were things that we really, really had to work on. Um, there was contemplation in the early days, should we change the name to something else? Uh, we ultimately opted not to do that. We actually had pulled a couple of early customers. They said, no, we like the Z. Well, you know, later on, as, as time goes on, it gets harder and harder to change that name. So if you are going to make a name change, do it really, really early on, before you launch, before you get some funding. Um, we talked about kind of elevating the message, uh, which doesn't have to relate just to your product. Subscription economy to, to, to Zora is, is a high level category. Uh, and then uh, don't give up. Um, Teen is, is one of the, the hardest working people that I've ever met, and he does not give up, and he's always there for, for the long haul. So this is something that, you know, there were a lot of people um, that, that had worked for Zora or that were, you know, collaborating with us and God, oh, the subscription economy message is not going to work. Well, eight years later, you know, Teen is sitting on CNBC with, with Jim Cramer talking about, not Zora, he's talking about, about the subscription economy and how there's all these different kind of macro trends happening. So don't give up if you have a, an idea that, that you really like. Now I'm going to shift gears to, um, to the space that I'm working in today. It's, it's more kind of space around big data. Uh, I had the opportunity to, uh, to, to be one of the first people at a company called a Yazdi to really kind of... Uh, uh, abstract technology that is, is different than your pure SaaS play application. It's uh, machine learning, uh, taking all this data inside, and without even asking a question of the data, it pops out kind of what the correlations and answers are. So this is developed by three mathematicians from Stanford University, 
And uh, I was the first business hire of this company, and it was really raw. It was pre-funding. We were working inside of a, basically a house uh, in Palo Alto. And uh, you know, my job was to figure out how to launch this company, how to get this company off the ground. I got three mathematicians, brilliant people, including the professor of mathematics at Stanford University. And how do you actually go get, get this company off the ground? The Node Coastal had already committed to investing uh, the first $10 million in the company. And there was also this thing that they kind of were, were doing called topological data analysis. I said, what the heck is topological data analysis? This is no category. How can I launch something like this? No one, no one is ever going to know what this is, or can they even say it? So um, what, uh, what we ended up doing was, was spending a lot of time around you know, how do we take this, this really deep mathematical concept uh, that today is actually the formation of a lot of kind of graph theories and graph networks, which is a really popular thing in, in the data space. But how do we take this really complex thing that has been around for hundreds of years and, and make it really, really simple? So what we launched with was, was something um, around the concept of, you know, a lot of companies in the space just take IBM Watson. We're talking about, uh, you know, finding insights through, through, through asking questions of data. So we said, you know what, we're the anti anti-finding, asking questions of data. Uh, with, with our technology, you don't have to ask a single question. You throw the data in and we're going to get you the answers. It's a little far-fetched, but we would lead you to where the answers are. So uh, we launched the company uh, about six months after uh, I joined and uh, we got a ton of coverage. Um, I mean, nobody knew about the company and you know, I had three mathematicians uh, on the, uh, you know, cover of the Wall Street Journal in print. They were in Bloomberg um, in, in, a, in a print article. They were on NPR, uh, talking on Here Now. I mean, they were all over the place. And uh, this was at a time when big data was also just getting started. So our, our job was to look different than everybody else who was talking about analytics or insights and a lot of these common buzzwords you hear in, in big data. Um, so the lessons that we learned from, 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 from this experience uh, are that experts, experts aren't always right. So when I joined, I was like, man, this name is tough. Uh, I already dealt with a Z name. I don't know if I can deal with an A name. So wh what do I do? And uh, I, uh, I uh, had really two options because the CEO said, well, we have to launch the company. So I don't want to go through a naming exercise because I already did that. And I already spent a lot of money doing that. Um, so before I came on board, given that I was the first business hire, they had paid an agency and invested in and, and resources to, to actually change the name. And, and the name that this agency came up with was Phenom. And it wasn't even phenom.com, it was phenom.net. I was like, are you crazy? And, uh, and then I said to the founders, how do you guys feel about this name? And, ah, we're a little bit un uneasy. I mean, I know we're, we're mathematicians and we think we're brilliant, but this Phenom thing is kind of not a really good play on, on, on what we, we really wanna, wanna do because they're very humble, down-to-earth people. Uh, just great people. So uh, over a weekend, I said, you know what? We're killing the name. We're going to go back to a Yazdi. It has meaning. Uh, it means two Sikh and Cherokee Indian. Uh, we have the .com URL. It's the name that you guys like and feel really, really comfortable with. Uh, so we went back to, to, to the VCs and said, okay, guys, we're not changing the name to Phenom. We're going back to a Yazdi. And we shifted gears and pivoted really quickly with about two months before we launched. Uh, we talked about kind of simplifying complexity, which is what we had to do when we're kind of moving away from this concept of topological data analysis. Uh, and, then, and then the last thing that we did was really work on telling a great media story. And uh, these were, were three mathematicians from Stanford that had never been inside of a, a, a company before. And, uh, and that requires um, putting um, the right discipline around training in place, but also right-sizing it for them. So there's a lot of folks out there that, that do media training, and there's a lot of great PR people out there, but you need to really right-size things. So what I did was I looked back at uh, companies that had an academic rooting, and I hired a, a group that trained Diane Green and the team over at VMware, because they were academics, and I used them to, to train uh, the founders of Yazdi because that was a great kind of bridge, and they felt really, really comfortable um, being with, with the trainers because they had worked with people in academics. And uh, we, we did a road show out in New York, and it was kind of a, a prif two months before launch to get these folks comfortable with some of the, the media and journalists, people that I knew. And then we ended up kind of launching uh, a month and a half later, and uh, 
the rest is history. The company has gone on to raise about $100 million in funding, uh, and I was there for about uh, the first two, two years of that. Uh, where I am today, I'm, I'm, I'm at Elastic. Elastic uh, is the, the company behind the open source projects, Elasticsearch, Kibana, Logstash, and others. Uh, just walking through kind of the hallway, there's, there's a lot of end users, so if you folks aren't developers, uh, maybe your developers are using our technology uh, underneath your systems. I see some of the folks out there like Totango, uh, that's Elasticsearch under the covers. And, uh, you know, with, with Elastic, what um, has been unique is because we are open source, we have a massive community. So we've had 45 million downloads over the past two and a half years, and we have 50 thousand community members uh, worldwide. Uh, we have endless number of users out there who are willing to tell their story. So the platform that I use around kind of building the brand is a little bit different. Uh, it's more about getting users to tell the story and to use those stories to talk to other developers and other architects. So it's less about telling a business story and trying to get these folks in front of the New York Times and Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg but more about telling a user story that is going to, to resonate with other people like them. So uh, Elastic Power's NASA, for example, which is a pretty exciting story. So you know, four times a day from, from the NASA Mars rover, there's streams of data that comes into to Elasticsearch, and they use that data to power all the space missions. Uh, and uh, there's, there's many, many other stories like that. So uh, with, with Elastic, the things that I'm learning now that I've been here for the past uh, a past year or so is, is, is build the community. So I have a team focused just on building the community and building the ecosystem. We don't really care about leads. Um, in fact, we don't put these people into our lead gen database. These are community people. Uh, and we do about 500 meetups a year around the world. Uh, and we spread the gospel uh, about Elastic. And it, it comes from the community. So uh, the best case is you have somebody from the community run the meetup organization, not uh, not, not somebody from, from, from Elastic, not a salesperson, for example, or a marketing person, but, but somebody who is actually a, a developer in the community. Uh, we also go out and, and, uh, and curate a lot of stories in the wild. Um, so we see a lot of things kind of uh, that are happening around the, the use of our technology. So we'll go get any user story and have these people tell their story and, uh, and author a blog on our side or, uh, you know, speak at one of our events or go speak at a meetup. Uh, and then um, the one thing that, that we're trying to do different here is we, um, I have an editorial staff um, that we're trying to build a very special voice. And, and right now it's not evident across our, 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 our site properties and, and our mediums, um, but we really, really want to be different. And, and if you talk to our, our founders, uh, they don't want to sound like other data, any other data company. And they want this personality to be fun and engaging and lively and... Uh, you know, we're, we're doing a user conference next week and, you know, a lot of the, 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 the keynote deck is, is, is going to insert a lot of the, the thinking from, from our founders where, where he's a big movie, uh, a movie buff. And there's a lot of quotes and themes from different movies that, that he wants inside of the, the keynote. So it's really kind of having this fun play on what we do, but obviously relating it back to our technology. So, you know, I make this statement that you have to find the voice and channel that voice of your founders uh, into how you go out there and create your brand. It, it's super, super important as you think about the, the longevity of, of your, your company and the longevity of, of, of your, your go-to-market strategy. So, you know, in summary, you know, no experience or company is, is the same. Uh, every, every experience is unique. So, again, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, and, and, and really uh, think long and hard about how you want, want to be different than... Than, uh, than, than what you've experienced before, or how you want to do something different than, than what you've done before. And uh, that's one of the things that, that at least I take, take a lot of, um, of, of focus in, in terms of where I move from, is, is not taking the same playbook and saying that it's going to work over and over again, because it usually doesn't. Uh, so, so being able to adapt. Uh, and brand building takes, takes a lot of time. You know, Salesforce.com in 2008 was not that big of a company. Uh, it was 3,000, 3,500 people. Today, it's 15, 16,000 people. It wasn't that big of a company. Uh, building the brand of Salesforce, building the brand of AppExchange. It took 10 years to do the AppExchange brand and to get it to where it is today. Salesforce took a long time. Uh, so building a brand takes time. So remember that, is that it does take time. 
And then having the right team, and the team can be internal, it can be external resources, but building the right team around you uh, is, is super important. But aligning that to the right goals that you have for brand building, is it to generate awareness? Is it lead gen? Uh, is it to, to, to launch the company? Uh, what, are, what are those goals? I think making sure that you have alignment to what those goals are are super, super important. And uh, you know, keep, keep iterating, right? Uh, keep iterating and you know, don't fire somebody just because they, they didn't achieve something. If you hire the right team, work with them, iterate with them. It's going to take some time. So those are the things that, that I would say in summary and in closing. And with that, I think we have uh, five minutes or so for questions. Yeah, great. That was great, Jeff. Thank you. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to ask one question. I actually want to piggyback off of the end of what you just said. There's a lot of young companies out here. Um, and if it's going to take five, ten years to really build your brand, how do you measure that you're on pace? How do you measure that you're on track after, let's say, you know, year one or year two? How do you know that you're heading in the right direction? I think first thing you got to do is you got to listen to your customers. You got to listen to your early users and adopters. And uh, you're going to get great feedback from, from these early folks. Are, are, are you on pace? And obviously, product, brand, market, product market fit, these things all need to come together. Um, but those first you know, three to five years of just listening to your customers uh, or your target customers is super, super important. Um, you know, we had to do that at Zora in the early days. In fact, we pivoted. A lot of the early, early customers were really, really tiny startups, but we decided that that wasn't actually the right set of customers for what we were trying to achieve. So we actually went a little bit upstream and we, we changed the bar from really selling to companies that had less than a million dollars in revenue to focus on companies that were between a million and five to 10 mil. So, uh, and that was all based on the feedback that we heard from, from our customers. Um, that, that, that our system was a little bit too complex for, for their needs. Great. So try something, listen to your customers, iterate, and keep trying. Awesome. So there are some questions uh, out in the audience. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, for B2B companies that have products that are used by end users as well, how do you draw the line between letting the stories of those end users come up, but also you know, having stories of your actual clients come up? Does that question make sense? Yeah, at least for us at Elastic, we don't really care. Um, we, we will, uh, because we have massive amount of end users, and then our customers are actually pretty large. We have a couple thousand customers, um, but we, we, don't, we don't discriminate between end users and customers. Um, what we do want customers to tell is how they are using um, really what we call our open core model, which are some of our commercial extensions, they're getting value from our commercial support. Um, but for, for end users, we view that there's a user journey and that a user who starts off as a free user, an open source user, as they mature in their development cycle or as their company matures, um, they have the potential, if they want to, uh, to become a customer. So, you know, we, we, don't, we just want to get as many great user stories out there as possible. And we, we actually look at that when we have a user conference is we want, want a balance. We, we don't want to just have all the, the paying customers be speakers uh, at, at our conference. Other questions? One over there. There's some mics coming. Thank you. Um, I have a company name that starts with Z as well. <laughs> and uh, my investors are concerned because uh, we'll be at the bottom of all lists. Uh, can you give me your view on that? Uh you go from Z to A was actually nice because we actually appeared at the top of the list, so that, that is a valid concern. That said, uh, I think you can build, build a great brand with, with a Z or a Y name. If you just take, take a consumer property like Yelp, they have a great brand. Uh, you know, there, there's plenty of other companies that have names at the end of the alphabet that, that are doing well. I think it's how you get out there and promote your brand uh, and, and, and get the, the right set of stories out there. So. If you have a great name with a Z, I wouldn't worry about it. I would just, just keep it as is. Try to find an, an A name is, is, is a little bit crazy. <laughs> uh, we have time for one or two more. There's one over here. We heard from uh, one of the other speakers earlier today that as a startup, you know, you're probably better off hiring um, talented young people rather than competing for experienced people. Does that work for marketing people as well? I mean, you mentioned the people in the press, you know, someone who's straight out of university ain't going to know no one. Uh, I, I think in marketing, uh, 
if you're just getting started, I think you, you, you can do a couple things. One is you're going to have a set of, of advisors that can advise on, on helping you get your company off the ground. Uh, and then you can hire somebody who's maybe mi mid-level or someone who's between kind of just getting started in their career, but they've seen a little bit of growth, maybe two or three years at a company, and they're going on year four, but they can really kind of take their career off um, and, and use this opportunity as a platform. Um, and as long as they have a good network where, where they can still learn from other people that are either mentors or advisors to them, I think that's a perfectly fine solution. I don't think you need to, if you're just getting started and you're bootstrapping your company, if you just raise your first you know, one mil or two mil, um, you probably don't need to go hire a, a VP of marketing out of the gate. I would focus on you know, how do you get product market fit or how do you just get your first 10 to 20 customers in the door if you're B2B. If you're, if you're B2C, then how do you get your first you know, 1,000 users and, and learn from that? All right, let's thank Jeff. That was epic. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you.